thank you so much. Man, I just love that. Um, you guys can bring the offering down. Uh, thank you. And we appreciate that. Uh, if, you have a, uh, if you have a Bible, turn to Titus. And um, it's uh, the book of Titus, three short chapters. Kids are making their way to Children's Church, and several of you are working down there. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciate your ministry. And um, I hope you've read through it several times because you've needed to. It's a short book. It's only three chapters. As you may know, uh, of course, when these were originally written, there weren't chapters and verses. Those were added later. Actually, two different people. I think it was something like eight or 900 years after the writing. So around eight, 900, maybe 1,000 A.D. is when chapters were added simply for the convenience sake of reference so you could refer to something. It was probably another 200 years before somebody sat down and laboriously added verses to it. Now, it was literally just some guys. Not much is known about him. It's not like it was the authority of some big powerhouse church of some sort of the day. It wasn't that at all. It was literally some uh, church leaders who said, you know, it sure would be a lot easier if we could refer to John 3.16 rather than say, somewhere in John's letter, turn like it's over here somewhere. So it was for reference sake. It was just ease. That's why you may notice in your Bible, if it breaks it up, the chapters a little bit, you'll notice sometimes that a chapter is in the middle of a thought, because he didn't always do a great job at it. <laughs> There's uh, verses that are split up thoughts that maybe shouldn't have been. Well, it's because a guy just did his best and it was nothing holy about it. It was just extremely practical. As you can imagine, it'll never be redone. Could you imagine if John 3.16 is now like somewhere else? John 4.12? I mean, it's just, it'll be forever what it is because we're now all used to it. So if you take this book, this book actually has turned out to be, like many of Paul's writings, pretty clean cut. Titus was pretty clean and easy. There are three major thoughts in the book of Titus. And he pretty much has them in his chapters of 1, 2, and 3. So this is pretty smooth and easy. Paul's writing to Titus, who is pastoring a little church on a little island, and said, let me help you get things straight, and we're going to talk about how you need to promote good works, and you need to maintain the good work of the church. That's the theme. And if you look at chapter 1, it's the organizational side of it elders and deacons, and how do you do that, and what are their qualifications? It's kind of like the, um, the handbook part is one. But then chapter two, which is what we're in today, it's about preaching and teaching God's Word and how God's Word is carried on. How do you take the wonderful grace of God and carry it on into the lives of other people? That's chapter two. And then chapter three is specifically good works. In fact, if you look in here, like if you have your Bible open there, like 116, they profess to know God, but they deny Him by their works. Detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Chapter 2, verse 7, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. Also, 2.14, the end, we're zealous for good works. Chapter 3, end of verse 1, good work. It happens again in verse 5. It happens again in verse 8. It happens again in verse 14. So what you do is you take your colored pencils, and you just kind of have your book of Titus open in front of you, and you see repetition like that. You pick a color and circle them. That's how I just did it. It's not because I memorized that. I'm just looking because they're all circled in red. So as I look at it now, things are popping out. Well, it's mentioned so much that people say, well, the theme of Titus is good works. It's maintaining good works. Yeah, that's a pretty good title. 
That's a pretty good theme. I see it all through there. Some of you don't want to ever write in your Bible. Am I right? Sacred book, you don't want to write in your Bible. That's okay. So what you do is you have Marty writing it for you. It's very easy. So you still can hold true. Um, or, or pick one up that, you know, isn't that really special one that you just, you know, we all have our favorite. So one that you could write in so that when you open it, you can see. I have the theme written right here in mine. I have the, the flow of it. Just writing thoughts so that the next time I read through Titus, I could pick up where I left off rather than start over again. So that's the overall theme and movement of the book. It's about good works. It's the organization of things in chapter 1. It's carrying God's Word, is what we're going to talk about today, chapter 2. And then chapter 3, about good works, the good works of the church. But today's going to be a little different. It's the first verses there. It's 2, 1 to 10. It's like the first big paragraph. That's how many have it divided as a paragraph. But rather than talk about what it's saying, we're going to talk about what it's doing. We're not going to go into the detail of what he is teaching. We're going to talk about how it's happening. How is he doing this? And I'm going to give it to you straight, just right off the bat. What we discover by what Paul is doing Titus is we have God's holy word under the inspiration of God Paul is writing to Titus pastor elder of the church so it's God's word the grace of God the goodness of what God's teaching and what he wants to accomplish and what he has for us as our mission in life his wonderful word is passed inspiration to Titus the elder, Titus, is taking it to the church because he's charged with taking it to the church. And we usually end there. There's another phase. And this third phase is then the church takes it to others. So we're going to walk through this process. So not so much the what, but how are they doing this? How do we get the wonderful grace of God, the goodness of Jesus Christ, his mission for us, how do we get into the community? How do we move it along? Well, we do it because God's written word is given to the pastor and leaders of the church. The leaders of the church take it to the congregation, but it doesn't stop there. It's got to keep flowing, and it goes from all of us into the lives of other people. Our kids, all three kids, played, uh, played soccer, and we went through that phase. I think of it, we do all the time. We'll drive by, like up here on the hill where they're playing soccer on Saturday. We're like, oh, those are great memories. I'm so glad they're over. Right? I mean, it's like, oh, you were supposed to bring snacks this week. Really? We do snacks? I'll go get the snacks. You get the kids that, right? Am I right? And grandparents? How many grandparents are doing it now? Yes. Right. They're great days and not at the very same time. And they come and go quick, so enjoy it while it's there. But the real small kids' soccer where they all just move with the ball right? You don't need a goalkeeper because there's no way they're staying down there. They just, wherever the ball is, they all move. Well, it's a great example actually of a lot of things in life where we need to spread out and do your job and make sure your job's, and trust me with what I'm doing over here, and that's what a team is. Those are lessons for in an office. That's lessons in church, and it's a lesson here in Titus. We crowd around the ball on Sunday morning because we're going to learn more. And so we learn more. We're challenged in God's Word, and we too often think it's so that I can just live a better life. It's for me, and it stops with me. So I take it in, and then it becomes me for my week. 
Well, it's the stagnant water thing. If it's not going to keep flowing through you, it gets stale. It's not just for you. It's for you to pass on to others. That's the peace that we're learning in Titus chapter 2, where he is specifically instructing them that you've got this generational thing going, and it's critical that you use the generations to pass on what you've learned into the lives of other people. So take a look at chapter 2. But as for you, teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Right? That's that second part. It's God's Word being taken to Titus. Now you teach what's in accord with sound doctrine. So now he's teaching it to others. Older men ought to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, love, steadfastness. Older women, like wise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanders, not slaves to much wine, not to, not to much wine. It means some. How's that for a practical application? Right there, holy word. It says, not slanders, not slaves of much wine. They are to teach what is good, that then train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, submissive of their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works in the teaching. Show integrity and dignity, sound speech that can't be condemned so that an opponent may not be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Even bondservants, to be submissive to their own masters in everything, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they be adorned to the doctrine of God our Savior. Paul's saying, you take this now to them, but make sure that they're modeling for the next one. Make sure that it just keeps going. So it literally makes us ask the question, who is walking more solid, more healthy, more abundantly, walking with the Lord today? They're they're walking better specifically because of your influence on them. That's the piece. We we'll always say we want a program to do it. Let's get a program. Every church needs a discipleship program. Now, I get the point, but it's a lifestyle. Everything we do is about discipleship. Everything we do is about us investing what we have, no matter what it is. And you think, oh, I'm not, I'm not worth multiplying. No, you walk with the Lord, and whatever your walk with the Lord is, that we're folding that into the life of somebody else. It's this process. The first one is extremely critical. It literally is God's holy word being given to Titus. It's the foundation of the whole thing. We believe that God's Word is the inspired Word of God. That used to be enough to say that. It's inspired Word of God. This is God-inspired writers who wrote, and those original copies were completely perfect, and they are inspired by God. But then over the course, and it's really been over the course of the last hundred and hundred years, where they say, yeah, it's inspired, but it's just inspired in concept. Just the general ideas are inspired. So then there's a, there's a council that would meet periodically. It's called the Chicago Council of Inerrancy, and they discuss this subject. And they go, well, it's not enough today to say, It's just inspired. Now we say it's verbally inspired. See what we did there? Every word is inspired by God. Turned out that wasn't enough because it's not uncommon today that people believe that it's inspired in its theological writing but not history, not maybe some of the stories. 
So then, verbal plenary inspiration. Plenary means all. All the words of the Bible are inspired by God. That's what we believe. You say, ah, some of it's pretty outrageous. Yeah, well, you have no idea. You need to meet the author. You don't know what outrageous is. You take the story of Jonah, and you say, ah, I don't know, it's pretty fanciful that this little character would be swallowed by this fish, and then he'd be spewed. I said, no, 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 no. You, you, didn't, you missed the big part. The big part was chapter 1 when it said, God said to Jonah to go to Nineveh. That's the mind-blowing part. The fish thing, that's nothing. Isn't that true? We literally had God telling Jonah to go to the actual heart of their enemy and tell them about God. That's the outrageous part. We believe it's all inspired by God. I read a shirt once, and it was, I admit it was funny. It said, the Bible is God's word. I know that because it said so. And I read it, and I went, oh, I get it. Yeah, I get it. Because every, every wacko cult leader says that they are a spokesperson of God. And look, I wrote a letter that proves it. Right? You see the trickery there? That that's the Bible, because the Bible claims it that that's claimed by many. Well, it's very, very different. You and I can be super confident that we believe that God's Word is God's Word as it was originally written in every single word of it. I mean, it's, it's inerrant all the way through. From locations and names to theology, it's God's holy Word. We believe that. Well, it said so, because it actually says that scriptures are not by a prophet's own interpretation, that's in Peter, or all scriptures given by inspiration of God in Timothy. No, it's more than that. It's the unity of this book. It's 40 authors over the course of thousands of years, and not just authors, it's from peasant to king over the course of thousands of years, and it has a unity of one message, that's impossible. That, that doesn't happen. You take other religious books, it's written by somebody, and it's internally coherent. But I see how they did it. That's not how this was done. The Bible's misused by many, and yet it comes out at the other end. There was a Voltaire, was a French philosopher, and he was a huge critic of Christianity and the Bible. And he said as publicly and as boldly as he could say that Christianity and the Bible would be gone in one generation. Oh, that, that made its way to America. Thomas Paine, it was at that time, Thomas Paine loved that message. Well, 50 years after the death of Voltaire, 50 years after his death, the Geneva Bible Society was using his press and his house to publish Bibles for the world. Isn't that fantastic? Well, the Bible said so in Mark 13. It says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. What's the number one published book in the world? It's it's the Bible. It'll be the Bible. There are, they don't have any idea. Five to seven billion copies have been made. There is no other book, religious book or otherwise, that is anywhere near in that category. So you and I, we give everything to this. We give our nod to this. This is what we teach. This is what we hold to. But then it has to go from the Word through elder pastor to us. That's that next step. 
That's the step that we all know. That's the step that we think is kind of the end of the story. It's critical that we come here. It's critical that we're a part of this fellowship. We don't home church ourselves. For those who say, my church is, and you name a television show, and that's your church, I'm sure it's an amazing service, and I watch some of them myself. It's no substitute for us being together. It's the energy of us in a room. Do you know what the number one reason people do go to church is? It's not the music. The Lord knows it's not the preaching. (laughs) We know that. We can vote for that one. It's you. By far, the number one reason people go to church is the fellowship. It's you. That's why a TV screen can't substitute it. A small group, a Bible study that meets before this service downstairs, that there's value to that that is above so much. We gather together and we gather together around God's Word. Acts chapter 2 gave us that template. Acts 2 says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer. That was the early church. I do send a, um, on Wednesdays, if you're interested, I send a devotional out on Wednesday, if you're interested in that. Um, uh, that is on Wednesday morning. I'll, I email those. If you're interested, just send me a note or a Lori in the office or myself, and we'll, we'll add you to that, uh, to that list. We're going to start a Bible study in January, uh, the first, I think it's the first part of January, Wednesday night Bible study, just to come together. And I'll be teaching that. And we're going to have a lot of fun and get a little bit more in depth into the Word. You're almost asleep because you know these first two. Literally preach into the choir. I know it's God's Word. I hold to it as God's Word. Yes, as a pastor, we know you're here to teach God's Word to us. Those two, we know. The third one should be just as easy it should be just as much as a fluent move from the one to the next to the third. And the third one is where we reach people we would never, ever reach. There it goes to places that we'd never imagine it goes, this third one. Because this third one goes to everywhere you've been this week. And you guys have been to some weird places this week. I mean, you've been to unique places that are just your places. It's your people. Some places that others in here are like, I can't believe you even go there. And you go, that's funny because I didn't invite you. It's fine. You don't have to go. It's my place. And you go to your place. And whether it's the grocery store or it's just your favorite club or place that you want to go or your work environment or your class schedule that nobody has the class schedule that you have. That is where God's Word goes. That's why it's God's holy Word to me and to us as leaders and then as we bring it to you and then we all take it from there to everywhere that we go. And there is a false understanding that we come to church so that my life is better. I'm going because my life is smoother when I go and when I participate and I feel better about myself and my problems are better understood and it's so ending of the story. I'm going to church for me. That is the exact same thing that I slip into, that we think that it's about us. And it's not about us. It flows through us, and it cleanses us. And yes, our life is better. And yes, we make better decisions. And yes, we have great contacts of people, and we have all this positive. But it's so that you can reach the people that only you can reach. 
Titus was, I think he started chapter 2 and 3 similarly. It says, but as for you, teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. As for you, you do this, chapter 3. Remind them. So Paul is taking it to the leader to say, you do this. You direct them. You teach them. But as far as us, as the crowd, it's the older, mentor the younger. It's got to keep going. It's got to go generationally. I think that's the value of this church. We have a struggle with music today because churches that mostly struggle with music are churches that are committed to keep generations together. Oh, I envy. I've been a part of. I know the churches that decide, you know what, we're just going to go right down the line and we're going to go contemporary because I know as a fact 20-year-olds are going to like it way better and 30-year-olds. Oh, I get that. And by and large, when you go into those facilities, those great churches that are reaching people for Christ, there's no criticism of them in that sense. But they have it easy because they're not trying to keep generations together. We are. We value that. We value a younger generation that says, I'm willing to give and not get exactly what I want. And we have an older generation that's saying, well, obviously I'm giving because I'm not getting exactly what I want so that we can be in the same room together. Because the value of what Titus is being taught is we, we're together because we're mentoring one another. We're taking it then person to person. It's a difficult challenge. You guys have accepted it. I think it's the right decision. It's going to continue to have its challenges. But it's challenges that we press through because of the value. We want to carry this on person to person. Every year, there are about 1,000 new church plants, but about 4,000 church closures. Half of churches have less than 75 people in them. I've been a senior pastor or associate pastor in churches of every size. A church of 25, I loved it. Some of our with great friends. Church of thousands, loved it. And in the middle, been there. Because there isn't a value in size. There is a value to growth. That's a value. Oh, it comes, it, it kind of goes in waves. And there are times in which some of the best days of a church, they call it, in, uh, they call it a Scottish revival. A Scottish revival, they say, is a revival where a church goes from 150 to 80. That that was the greatest days of their life because they lost those 70 people. So that's a Scottish revival. So it goes, through, it goes through phases along the way, but ultimately, it's like a stock market, right? Stock market drops, but the, the promise is just hang on, give it time. That is true of a local body. We're to be reaching people for Christ. We're to be investing in our generations. We're to be developing people in our own ranks. You've done that in your past. We'll do that again greatest youth pastor we could hire is one that came up through our ranks. They're one of us. Because the older, we're investing in the younger. I was making a, um, uh, an English muffin, making one. Yeah, that's what I was doing. I was making it. I was toasting it. That's, that's, that's the level of making it. And I and I put, I put no small amount of peanut butter on it. I mean, it's like when you give it to your dog, you know, and they go, you know, that's always funny when the dogs do that. I was that dog. I was like, okay, that was too much peanut butter, and I couldn't even talk. It was so much. So as I was wiping that on there, and I was just, for some reason, I was thinking, well, you know this peanut butter on its own? I would never eat that much peanut butter. Like, but I think it's okay that I just put it on this English muffin this way. It's something about the mixing. 
it's a salad. You have all those ingredients in a salad, and I love the feta cheese, and, the, and I like the peppers are mixed in there, and it's all mixed together, and the more mixed it is, the better. The mixing, it's that third point of the mixing that you're empowered to go to your school and be an influence for Christ of what you've learned and what God's doing in your life through your local fellowship, you are now empowered to go and mix in with your school and make a difference. It's not just we're just going to protect you and hold you back so that you'll be okay getting through those years. No, those are the greatest years where you can reach people for Christ. We go, and what's in us is greater than in the world, and we can go out, and we can be a positive influence. And that's what we're called to do, is to take what we have in us and influence in the lives of others. I'm going to suggest two ways to do it. One is generally generally. Generally is literally being a salt and light wherever you go. I wish we could just go to the grocery store and just keep our head down and check out and complain about the prices and, and just leave. Well, we're not, we don't have that luxury. We're in line, the cashier's standing there and he doesn't want to be there and we have an interaction generally wherever we go. It was really funny at Ollie's, not this one, the one that just opened, but it was end of the shift. Where were we? Belvern? Yeah, I think we were over in Belvern. Yeah, we're branching out in the community. <laughs> and uh, if we were at Belvern and the gal, we were fortunately in that frame of mind. And so we're checking out, and we bought junk that we didn't need. That's what Ollie's is for, right? Okay. It's like, well, I've never known to want that. I guess I'll get three. And so we're in, we're in line, and we're, we're getting our stuff there. And, um, and she was tired, and she's probably 23 or something, and she's just tired. And I said, are you out of here soon? Isn't it about to close? She goes, yeah, but then we stick around for an hour. And I said, oh, but that's great, because then once the doors are shut, you can just start yelling at people in here, and you can just do whatever you want. And, and she said, she goes, oh, I wouldn't do that. I said, well, no, no, I wouldn't either. I mean, I'm just saying that you could. And she laughed. She goes, oh, no, I'm just really nice to people. And then I think Sarah said, um, Sarah said well, pastor, um, <laughs> her head popped up, and she goes, you're kidding. And I went, no. Ah, Kind of. And she goes, that is the funniest thing I've ever heard. You were telling me to do something bad, and you're a pastor of a church. We laughed. She, was, she couldn't stop laughing. She was almost like, just take your stuff and go. That was hilarious. That was the funniest thing. It made her day. And she talked about her church. She's Assemblies of God, and I've got some great Assemblies friends, and we're chatting a little bit. It's that everyday influence. That's what we need. Do it your way. Judge me for the way I do it, you're fine. I'll, I won't judge you for your way. You're in line, you're talking, interacting with the community. We are to be an influence of salt and light in the community. We take God's word, we believe it's the full inspired word of God. We come in here and we hear about it, we get challenged to it, but we can't stop there. We go out into the community, and you do it with your personality and your mood for the day, and you just do it generally, generally, whoever you come in contact with. But then we also do it very deliberately. You've got to find people. They don't need to know. But you've got time to do it. Because God's given you time. If you don't, we rearrange. Who is it that you could call, that you need to call to get together with because they're struggling? And if there's an area specifically this church is good at, it's that. When somebody in here is struggling and people know about it, am I right? This church is really good about reaching out. 
I'm also talking about out there. It's a coworker that's struggling, and you know no other coworkers helping him, offering him support, offering him help. And whether it's a comment or whether it's sitting with them, how do you take the grace of God that is in each of our lives and move it on, is generationally, move it on into the lives of other people because it's not just for you. You want to be fresh in your faith? You want to be fresh in your walk with God? Allow it to flow through you. Don't hold it. They get stagnant. It's the freshness of God's grace goes in us, and then it goes through us into the lives of other people. But I will say, if you don't know for certain that you even have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, you have to start there. There is no grace in your life. You don't earn it, and you don't do it, get it just because you're doing good. It's only through faith in Jesus Christ. He died for you because he loves you, wants to give you a relationship with God through faith in him alone. If you don't know that, that's where it starts. And once we have that, we continually grow together in here so that we go out there and make it known spread it generally into the lives of people, and then very specifically or deliberately in the lives of those who need it. Let's pray. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can do it right now. Heads are bowed, and we're just for this quiet moment. If you've never received Jesus, put faith in him, you can right now. Just between you and God, you can pray these words. Heavenly Father, I need you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his death, his burial, resurrection for me. I trust him for eternal life. And no one looking around and you say, you know, I, I've never received Jesus. I've never put my faith in him, but I just now did. No one's looking. Just to acknowledge it to me, just lift your hand up so I can pray for you. Just lift your hand up and right back down again. It's real simple. That's right. Just would love to pray for you. Heavenly Father, for the rest of us, please lay in our hearts somebody that we need to take those extra steps with. Help us to be your grace in the lives of people around us more than we even have been. In Jesus' name, amen.